learning outcomes after studying this module you shall be able to learn about the information communication and technology secondly evaluate how information market works thirdly identify the limitations of information markets fourthly analyze the network goods and compatibility markets we start with introduction the information communication and technology sector has been an emerging sector in the world it has been integrating the entire world free from the dichotomy of the developed and the developing countries in its wake of expansion and development the sector has realized the possibilities of economies of scale economies of scope network effects etc in the initial phase of production a firm faces high cost and as the firm progresses the costs start falling as economies of scale are realized in the later stages firms might realize economies of scope and network effects to their advantage the firms who had witnessed a head start might scare away the rival firms and might also block innovations and inventions by potential innovators who are willing to invest in new opportunities this has been a recurring phenomena in not only the industries dealing in consumer products like watches apparel etc but also industries relating to mobile telephone and information technology known as ICT sector the current module discusses about information markets the limitations involving them the possible solutions and challenges related to information markets then the module proceeds with discussion of network goods and compatibility markets and then integrates the aforementioned with information technology sector the last section discusses a case study on microsoft corporation in the light of its monopoly power and the reaction of the us government towards the use of such power we move on to the information markets a common issue is how to seek people to collect information on particular areas and to coax them to reveal whatever information they possess to each other so as to get consent on the subject matter if people are always honest about their opinion with themselves and others the ideal institution of operation would be a plain conversation however this is rarely seen in practice information markets are institutions of operation for this task via trading in speculative markets on matters in which truth can be figured out at a later stage relative to a simple conversation it is difficult to come out with a single response by market trading and there exist fewer things that one can come up with when people do not know whom to believe the things people do say in information markets can be easily believed those who have only a little information are encouraged to be quiet and those who think they know more than they actually do learn the fact by losing we are moving to limitations of information markets the limitations of markets related to an ordinary conversation relate to the issues with design concerning how to lower the cost of trading how to bolster what all to be said by trading and which questions should be asked to the traders there are several questions relating to an information market an ordinary market wherein an asset is traded for others question the relative value of the assets for appropriately defined asset the question regarding the probability of the event can be raised therefore markets go by conditional probabilities and conditional expectations the cost of asking questions via markets depend more on the number of questions which are asked rather than the type of questions that are asked this suggests that one must concentrate on questions that influence the most crucial decisions and hence estimate important outcomes conditional on big decisions one potential problem with asking such questions is that market prices might not be able to truly represent the information with the traders when they suspect that the decision makers will have more information this problem can be avoided if decision makers and their advisors can trade if the time of decision making is known to the traders and if 
prices that existed just before the decision was made are relied upon. Another related issue is that people might decide to achieve favorable decisions. However, laboratory experiments for price manipulations have not confirmed this suspicions by far. A theoretical model can be formed by adding agents who are concerned about the market price to standard market micro models. Agents with some private information indulge into hedging. Such traders might add noise term to the prevailing prices. Since their existence attracts attention from informed traders who might gain from trading with them, the prices tend to become more precise. Another issue with creating the incentives is to say the truth is that the people might cause harm in wake of making what they say true. If one can adulterate a drug product at random after selling the manufacturer's stock and can hide himself or herself from the trading audits, the person might get a profit in proportion to his or her wealth and the thickness of the stock market. The existing markets that seem to provide with opportunities for this type of behavior are far thicker to audit than any new information markets. There also exist problems associated with coaxing the people to say things via markets. Rational agents should not trade to merely bet with one another. If the desired participants communicate about similar matters in other contexts, they might communicate through markets to enhance their reputation and goodwill. If they are getting paid by an employer, the employer might need to be rewarded for taking through markets. Now we move on to other issues and solutions. Rational informed traders whose sole purpose lie in making money might get attracted to real money markets by the existence of noise traders and traders that want to affect the price. However, instead of indulging into this, one might fulfill the same task by subsidizing automated inventory based market makers. The subsidy usually goes to those who acquire the new information. In a market where the question is in form of a single estimate such as probability or expected value, a trader who makes or accepts an offer to trade questions that the estimates in hand is at least or at most of a particular value. All the other traders answer that they do not disagree with what the present offer says. Any conversation of this kind is limited, though in theory, among the rational honest agents, it should lead to an agreement for the best estimate. Ordinary conversations regarding any one estimate are often assisted with the discussions of related estimates. If two people were trying to estimate how long it takes to drive from New Delhi to Chandigarh, then they might do better if one of them could say it would take two hours to travel from Delhi to Agra and two hours to travel from Agra to Chandigarh. Similarly, the market conversations might also be assisted by allowing the traders to say more kinds of things so that they might be combined to get the larger picture. This should help when a part of what people are aware of are the relations between different estimates. A direct approach would be to allow the traders to say more kinds of things in order to form more types of assets and then invite traders to make offers on these assets. However, this approach might turn into a thin market problem. A trader will not offer to trade an asset if she or he is of the view that it might not get accepted quickly. He or she might suffer when a new public information goes against his or her offer. For this reason, trading tends to focus on assets where offers are likely to be accepted quickly. Call markets in which the offers are matched together at standard times can avoid the problem. The combinatorial matching markets wherein the traders make offers on packages of items and software such as for sets of offers which can all be satisfied together can allow traders even when no two traders make offers on the same asset item. Matching markets allow traders to make complicated 
logical dependencies among their offers such as allowing only one of two alternate offers to be accepted or making one offer invalid unless the offer is accepted. This allows traders to say more in the market conversations. However, it might be very expensive to create such a market maker for every estimate anyone might make, but with a market scoring rule. The only cost is for adding another base variable such as distance from Delhi to Chandigarh in order to expand the space of possible cities. Given base variable funding, there are no additional costs for subsidizing trades in all logical and probability combinations of these variables and there is always an exact present value for such estimates. In this situation, traders can then talk freely about all the included variables having both the ability and the incentive to reveal anything they might know about them through trade. There exist computational issues in aiding such trades. Moreover, it is still unclear as to how to best integrate these market makers into a general matching market. Also, it is still vague as to what types of user interfaces can best allow people to browse the current estimates to find the ones they want to change and to help them decide the types of package offers they would want to make. Now we move on to network goods and compatibility market. The value of almost every good is influenced by aggregate consumption level in its market and the markets for the related goods. In most of the cases, high aggregate demand for a good or its complementary commodity leads to increase in value of the good. Such relations are known as the network externalities. While such effects are greater in some markets like that for fax machines, printers and computers, for most of the other goods they are small. The effect of these consumption spillovers on the production decisions made by the firms depend on the extent or magnitude of the network externalities along with the power that the firms exhibit in making their output compatible with the output of rivals and producers of complementary goods. In the market wherein these types of externalities are powerful and the firms are free to choose among different standards, the advantage of conforming to a popular platform must be weighed against that of horizontally differentiating output. Conforming to a common standard exploits the added value concerned with the network externalities but also increase the number of close substitutes. Adopting a unique standard can increase monopoly pricing power but fails to exploit the positive externality from sales of other firms. The economies of technical standard choice has gained enormous importance in recent years given the explosion in information technology and the dramatic network externalities that affect those markets. Firms that compete in markets where network externalities are present face unique trade-offs regarding the choice of a technical standard. Adherence to a leading compatibility standard allows a firm's product to capture the value added by a large network. However, the firm loses direct control over the market supply of the good and faces more intra-platform competition simultaneously. Alternatively, compliance to a unique standard allows the firm to face less or no intra-platform competition, but it sacrifices the added value associated with a large network. The tension between these economies forces shape the coalition formation equilibrium in these markets. Now we move on to evolution of information technology and network. The expansion of mobile phone network in the developing world has had several common characteristics. The initial networks were built in the cities and served the sophisticated and elite class. The prices of the handset were very high but fell dramatically with the reduction in cost of handset components and economies of scale, making phones accessible to poorer consumers. The operators adapted to this broader base of potential subscribers by expanding the coverage beyond urban centers, top rural areas and by reducing the usage prices. The economies of scope came to be realized because 
the component makers began producing the related components. Say for example, a monitor producing company comes to realize that if it manufactures produce keyboards along with it, it might benefit. This might be the case since the firm has already been dealing monitors, has a goodwill in the market, has information relating to the choices and preferences of consumers in the market, has contact with suppliers, know about the market conditions and so on. This is just an example of what has been realized in the ICT sector in the past and even today. Now we move on to the evidence. We start with the Microsoft case. In 2000, the Justice Department took on Microsoft in one of the biggest antitrust cases in the world. By that time, Microsoft had become the world's most valuable corporation. The government sought the breakup of the corporation. The case comprised of most of the issues raised by information goods. Microsoft was a monopoly. Apart from the Apple customers and Linux users, almost all personal computers use the Windows operating system. The most important fact bracing the Windows system was the force of network externalities. People use Windows operating system because the other people used it. The government did not, however, challenge the Windows monopoly itself. Basically, everyone agreed that monopoly is a natural phenomena in such industries and should not be blocked. What the government claimed, however, was that Microsoft had used its monopoly power in operating system to give its other products an advantage over rivals in other markets. The government argued both that monopolies were being created unnecessarily and that Microsoft was in a sense discouraging innovation by other companies using its monopoly power. The government claimed that the other potential innovators in the software industry were unwilling to invest large sums of money out of fear that Microsoft would use its control of the operating system to take away any market share that they might win. For its part, Microsoft argued that by setting the precedent that companies would be punished for success, the government was in fact the hindrance towards innovation. At first, the case went against Microsoft when the splitting of the corporation in two into an operating system company and a company selling other products by Microsoft were ordered. However, it was overturned and appealed. The government reached a settlement with Microsoft in which the company agreed to provide other companies with the technique to develop products that interacted with Microsoft software, thus removing the corporation's advantage. However, the rival companies complained that the negotiation had far too many escape clauses and that Microsoft's ability to exploit its monopoly position would not cease. The government complied. The antitrust lawyers from the Justice Department reported that they were increasingly uneasy about the plan to spur competition. A particular concern was a rumor that Microsoft might take over the market in publishing software which was being led by Adobe Acrobat. Now finally we move on to the summary. There has been expansion of ICT sector throughout the world. In its conquest, the information communication and technology sector has seen economies of scale, economies of scope, network effects and so on. We have talked about information markets, the limitations pertaining to them and the solutions and the challenges facing the markets. We talked about how companies have been using their power to scare off rival firms and the role played by the government in home countries react to such situations through a case study of Microsoft Corporation.